Mr. President, Dr. Biden, Madam Vice President, Mr. Emhoff, Americans, and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace, and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always just is. And yet, the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to Glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert. How could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce, and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens. But one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright.
So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind swept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked south. We will rebuild reconcile and recover in every known nook of our nation in every corner called our country our people diverse and beautiful will emerge battered and beautiful when day comes we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid the new dawn blooms as we free it for there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it if only we're brave enough to be it if only we're brave enough to see it i believe we are brave enough to see it and that's why we're here today let me welcome you to the university of texas at san antonio we're celebrating Black History Month. <laughs> I'm Carla Broadus. Let me first make sure that we all realize how we even began celebrating Black History Month. Black History Month was the brainchild of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. He had this thought about having a Black History Week back in 1915 when he traveled from Washington, D.C. to the University of Chicago to celebrate the Emancipation of Proclamation anniversary that they were holding. He then asked his fraternity, Omega Psi Phi fraternity, to assist him by coming up with a Black History Literature Week, of which they did. And that was in 1924. Many people think that Dr. Woodson came up with February as the month because it was the month that Abraham Lincoln and Dr. Frederick Douglass were born. Those were their, it was their birth months. Dr. <clears throat> President Gerald Ford, then in 1976, officially designated the month of February as Black History Month. And so now we have this month in order to celebrate our Black history, which we at UTSA get to enjoy it all year because we've been blessed enough to have an African-American studies program and many programs here at the university all year long. Let me stand in for Dr. Alejandro Elenas. Dr. Elenas is our department chair for race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality studies. Within our department is Mexican American studies, African American studies, and women's studies. We are a relatively new department. Dr. Elenas has been with us for a year now. If she's made it an entire year. Oh, no, it hasn't even been a year yet. Excuse me. She's been with us a semester. She's doing a fantastic job. And we are very, very proud because most recently we just won a Mellon grant to work on social justice. Dr. Elenas, I'm sure, would want me to say that we're super happy to also have Dr. Taylor Amy as our president. I have to make sure that everyone knows that Dr. Amy, when we were marching for MLK this year, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we couldn't march has marched alongside me every year. 
since he came to the university. So I am very, very proud to introduce to you our uh, outstanding university president, Dr. Taylor Amy. Carla, thank you. And uh, I, uh, I want to begin by making this observation before I start my introduction. I, Amanda Gorman is the hope of our future and really amazing. <clears throat> so thanks, thanks for that kind introduction. I really want to acknowledge one of our special attendees today, Araneta Pierce, a civic leader and member of the Texas Women's Hall of Fame. As you know, Araneta has been an essential voice in our community about equity, diversity, and inclusion, and her advocacy continues to this day. I understand that we also have several current members and alumna of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority with us, including our guest speaker, Dr. Whelan. Thanks so much for all of you joining us here today in this very, and very important conversation. It's true, UTSA is so proud to celebrate Black History Month and contribute to our national conversations. We are hosting a particularly outstanding slate of Black History Month events this year. As a learning community, we embrace our role as a place where our university and local community members can come together to explore the most important issues of our day. One of the ways we fulfill that role is by bringing some of our nation's leading thinkers to speak to our community, both physically and this year virtually, to share their insights, inspire ideas, and generate conversation. Dr. Bell Whelan is sure to do all of these things today, and I am so delighted to introduce her to all of you. She's, by the way, one of my bosses. Dr. Whelan is currently the president and CEO of the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, which is the regional body that accredits over 31,000 educational institutions in the Southern United States from Texas to Tennessee, including UTSA. She is the first woman and first African-American to serve in this very, very important capacity. Her leadership in the higher educational world is legendary and we are so honored to have her here with us today. Her resume and track record are as impressive as they are inspiring. In more than 40 years of deep and committed service to higher education, she rose through the ranks from a faculty member to a college president to the Secretary of Education for the Commonwealth of Virginia. What a trajectory that is. Dr. Whelan has been named one of the 100 most powerful women in Washington by Washingtonian Magazine. She is a recipient of the Woman of Distinction Award from the American Association of University Women, as well as the American Association of Community Colleges Leadership Award. Her legacy of contributions to local, state, and national organizations is vast and includes many, many board memberships at leading educational entities such as Excellencia in Education, the American Association of Community Colleges, and the National Student Clearinghouse. There are so many more things that I could be sharing about her career and trajectory, but there's one thing that's so, so apparent about Bell. She is a woman of service. Dr. Whelan, on behalf of the Roadrunner community, and behalf of our celebrating Black History Month, we are so grateful to have you with us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do for higher education, for college students around the country. Everyone on, the, on this call today, please, please welcome Dr. Bell Whelan. Bell, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. President, but I beg to differ. Uh, you're my boss because our members run this organization and I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be able to serve that role. Uh, I remember when UTSA opened, and so I congratulate you and your predecessors who have grown the university uh, to the uh, quality institution that it is today and wish you much continued success. It's difficult for me not to tear up when I look at the people on this call because they've either raised me or I've raised them. <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like coming home. It really is. And so I thank all of you for taking time out of your schedules today to join, uh, to join this conversation. The one thing I can say about my, uh, my life is that it has been driven by excellence. And I think the, the key to being driven, if you will, by excellence is that you have to have a support group behind you to make sure that you can achieve the goals that you set. 
And certainly many of you on this call have provided me that opportunity and I thank you very much. I usually tell people I'm an old lady who's had lots of jobs and there's, that, there's a lot of truth to that. This is my 47th year in higher education. I'm trying for 50, but you know, with COVID and everything else it breaks out, it, it's like, why am I still doing this? But I'm, as long as I have support uh, from folks like you, Taylor, I'm gonna be hanging in here. I grew up in San Antonio, but I was not born in San Antonio. Like many people uh, who have migrated to the area, I was three when we moved uh, to San Antonio. My mother grew up there and she didn't like the Chicago winters. So she convinced my father to come back to San Antonio. And I, I grew up there. I'm a product of Holy Redeemer Elementary School, St. Gerard High School, Trinity University. Uh, and spent 13 years as an employee of uh, San Antonio College. And I told people, I think I'm the only person on the universe that began their career at SAC and will end it at SACS. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's interesting, but I, I, I did it because number one, I had a mother who told me I could do anything. Uh, number two, I had a support group of a grandmother and a great aunt and my mother's sister, my aunt, and a bunch of their friends who uh, held me up and, and made me believe that I could do anything. I grew up during the 60s. And in San Antonio, it was very interesting because uh, blacks and yeah, we, we were still black in the 60s. My grandmother was colored, my mother was Negro, I'm black, and my son's African American, so it's hard to keep up. But in the 60s, we were, we were black and we were proud to be black. James Brown even wrote a song that told us we were black and we were proud. Uh, and they, uh, they held us up to the fact that we could do anything that we wanted to do. There were now federal laws that prohibited people from discriminating against us just because of the color of our skin. But we also, I also grew up during a uh, revolution of gender because college women had decided that they wanted to leave the suburbs and take their college degree out into the real world and start making a difference. And so here I am, uh, you know, a black female, I knew no limits. Uh, so anything I tried, I, I always uh, was taught that, you know, you have to try. You don't know at what you can succeed until you've tried it. Uh, and I always ask questions. That hasn't changed. Those of you who have known me all my no life know that how inquisitive I am. And I still ask questions. Uh, but that's the way you get ahead. And I felt that I was in an environment that supported that. As I grew through um, high school, I was in Girl Scouts for a year. I couldn't take it anymore because I didn't like the outdoors and didn't want to go camping. Um, but I sold lots of cookies while I was there. Moved into college and uh, found Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. My mother was a Sora and it, I probably wasn't any more choice. I didn't even think about it. But even if I had had that option, I think I still would have chosen AKA. Sorry, Tracy. Uh, but uh, it's it has always been the, the group of women being an only child. I had no sisters or brothers. So it was always that group where I could find somebody on whom I could depend to help me get through various situations. I graduated from high school at 16 going to college. And so I was still a baby. I was jail bait for the first two years. And so I had to depend upon my friends and my mother's friends uh, to help me survive and not feel weird or odd because I was so much younger than everybody else around me. Uh, and got to college at 16, it was just wonderful until I found out that nobody was gonna date me but until I turned 18 cause they didn't wanna get in trouble with my mom. And even after that, it was sketchy at best. Left, left undergraduate school with a major in psychology and sociology, went to LSU, first time I'd ever been away from home. And it was the first time that I ran into overt racism. In San Antonio growing up, blacks were only 6% of the population because in the 60s, uh, Hispanics and whites were all considered white. You were either black or white. And so we didn't have the same kind of discrimination that people in Mississippi and Alabama and you know Georgia had. Uh, and so, I was sheltered from the kinds of discriminations. Probably experienced some in high school because I was, there were five blacks in my freshman class, two in my sophomore class, and I was the only one in my junior and senior classes. Uh, but I never felt different. I always felt included. Never dawned on me that nobody ever invited me to their house, but then I didn't invite them to mine either. So it turned out okay. 
when I got to college, uh, you know, I, it was great. I was the first black cheerleader they ever had, uh, you know, big mouth running my mouth ever since. And uh, you know, it served me well, Taylor, as president of the commission, because I have no problems, you know, shouting out all the good stuff that our member institutions are doing. But got to LSU and I was a first year graduate student when David Duke was a senior at LSU. And they still had Klan marches up and down Highland Boulevard when I was in, uh, in graduate school. And it was like, oh, my God, what have I done? The only saving grace was they also had streakers the same year. And so there was some levity involved in the situation. Um, I started tutoring people in my classes and they were getting A's and I was getting B's and I never quite understood that either until I talked with my major professor who said, you know, Miss Smith, that's all we can do for you. Um, I had de was determined I was going to stay through the doctorate uh, because that was the program in which I was enrolled, but my mother took ill, so I came home. Couldn't, uh, didn't know as much about psychology then and what jobs you could get if you weren't majoring in clinical psychology, but I knew I could teach. And we had two community colleges at that time, St. Philip's College and San Antonio College. And I went over to St. Philip's College looking for a job because I knew everybody over there. They either went to school with my mama or church with my grandmother. So, you know, I'm bopping over to St. Philip's, except at the time they had a chairwoman of the psych department who said, I have one black woman working for me. I don't need another one. Go try SAC. So I went to SAC. They didn't have one. They hired me on the spot. Uh, you know, didn't bother me. I'd had rejection before. We can go and turn this uh, lemon into lemonade. And I was there for 13 years. Best experience of my life. I do remember my job interview, though, with the dean who said, I see that you went to Trinity for undergraduate school. Why didn't you go back there looking for employment? And I wanted to say because I didn't have a doctorate and they were only hiring people with doctorates. But I told him that I had friends who had gone to SAC and I knew that they went because they wanted an education. They didn't go because of the band or the football team or because they were a legacy, but because they wanted to make a better life for themselves. And that's where I felt I could do the best good. And so I began teaching psychology and stayed there 10 years. A couple of folks on this call were in my class uh, <laughs> and survived, turned out okay. Um, I, during that time, got married, adopted a baby. Uh, Reggie is fine, by the way, for those of you who know me, he's now 36, living in Northern Virginia, um, and, but still my baby. But when he was 10 months old, his father decided he didn't want to be married anymore. So I said, bye, I was fine before I met you. I'm gonna be fine when you're gone because I knew I had a support system that was not going to let me fall. Uh, and again, many of those folks are here on this call today. I managed to go from being a faculty member uh, into administration as uh, the president said, you know, onto two college presidencies and the secretary of education. I've been in this job 16 years. But I did it all because people believed in me. And in my life, many of those people were women. One of the things that, uh, that I do is I find these little nuggets that I hold on to. And so when I get depressed or overworked or one of Taylor's uh, colleagues will call me with some garbage that I have to deal with and keep a smile on my face. So I pick these things up. One of them is a sign that I have here in the office that says leadership isn't all glory. Uh, and I remind people, you know, you aspire to be in charge, but let me tell you what comes along with being in charge. It is not all glory every day. You can't get caught up in the accoutrements that go along with it. But one thing that I will remember vividly was in 1995, Essence Magazine uh, celebrated its 25th anniversary. And um, Susan Taylor was the executive director uh, or a publisher of the magazine, and her husband, Kefra Burns, wrote a prose that for me described my life and all the stuff that I had had uh, to, uh, to which to aspire and all of the role models that I had. And I've, I've got to share it with you today because it just, it moves me every time. Uh, I, I have to admit, I put a little attitude in it, so it's okay, but you know me, so. So this is talking about the magazine at 25. <laughs> Girl, look at me, not even one month old and calling for a revolution. Truth be told, I was a revolution. I'm 25 now, a woman of my time, a product of my own generation. I know who I am. I was conceived in the struggle with Black power and the women's liberation movement made it in the hotbed of social unrest. When I was born in the dawn of the new decade, I cried, Black is beautiful, sisterhood is powerful. I had emerged full grown, the, uh, the real Aphrodite, and had a nine inch Afro to prove it. Fact is, I was fine. And for the first time, I knew it. 
knew that it was, I was stunning in all my licorice black, cocoa brown, and caramel and cafe au lait skin tones. I turned 400 years of pain into pride, as for the first time, I was loving the soft contours of my African nose and my full, luscious lips and the ample round behind that Black men call my onion because it brings tears to their eyes. Said I had more English in the small of my back than Webster in the, had in the dictionary. But never mind English. Habari Ghani, sister. Habari Ghani, brother. In the 70s, we had decided to speak Swahili, and you were going to liberate some of this good loving in the name of the revolution. But then when I turned the, to wage the struggle on the gender front, the revolutionary fire and rhetoric just went right out of you. Mm -mm, it's right out here in the book, my diary for the last 25 years. Oh, I know you loved me. How could you help yourself when I was too beautiful to be ignored, too determined to be denied, much too outspoken to be seen and not heard, and otherwise just too marvelous for words? Back then, they called me Fannie Lou Hammer, Angela Davis, and Shirley Chisholm. That was me who marched into Atlantic City and told the Democratic Convention I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I had a history of tired in my bones, not the kind that makes you want to sit down, but makes you want to get up. I was the voice of the Black Revolution. I was the first real Black candidate for president, too. They call me a nervy so-and-so, a troublemaker, a subversive. But since I was elected to the Senate in 92, they call me Senator Mosley Braun. I've been called a lot of things lately, Congresswoman, Surgeon General, Secretary of Energy, Mayor, and more. At 25, I'm a Renaissance woman, already a legend in my pride. Forgive me if I boast a bit, but I'm an Emmy-winning, oscar copping Grammy-grabbing, Pulitzer Prize poet, Nobel laureate, beloved. My word, yes, I'm bookish, on everybody's bestseller list. Seems like all my best conjure comes out in words, words that cast spells like the songs of Solomon, like jazz, words that possess the secret of joy. I know you know me. I was that sass-mouthed color girl on Broadway who couldn't just sing a nice Somewhere Over the Rainbow song. I spoke for the tree and the rock and the river when morning dawn and a rallying pulse kept hope alive in America. My byline alone would fill a volume or two. I'm Toni Morrison, I'm Maya Angelou and Rita Dove, I'm Terry McMillan and Alice Walker and Gwendolyn Brooks. Look me up sometimes, I'm in the book. I've gone from Motown to Tinseltown, but I've never forgotten where I came from. I went from lead singer supreme to Hollywood's first leading lady in a big screen black love story with Billy D. But I haven't forgotten that back before my time, Lady Day could only play a maid in the movies. I've given my own talent a two thumbs up because 25 years of raves right here say Sister Axe and Claudine and Sounder, Malcolm X and The Color Purple. You saw my name when the credits rolled. I'm Diane Carroll and Diana Ross and Cecily Tyson and Whoopi Goldberg. I'm Halle Berry and Angela Bassett. I'm a Hollywood mogul and an entertainment empire. I'm Suzanne DePaz. I'm Oprah Winfrey. I've had to orchestrate my own fanfare for 25 years, so forgive me if I toot my own horn for another chorus or two, but from R&B to pop, from rap to rock, everything I touch turns gold. I battled my way into the opera houses. I sing jazz, I am jazz, and my song is simply unforgettable. You know me, but just for the record, I'm Sarah Vaughn and Nancy Wilson, Natalie Cole and Aretha Franklin, Whitney Houston and Janet Jackson. I'm Kathleen Battle, Leontine Price and Jesse Norman, and both, oh, by the way, I run the company now too. So you didn't catch my name? I'm Sylvia Roan. Olympic in strive and epic in my progress, I've trump triumphed in every field of endeavor. I'm the fastest woman in the world, the president of a Fortune 500 company and a space shuttle astronaut. I'm Florence Griffith Joyner, Ann Fudge and Dr. J. May, May Jemison. Like an Afro-American express card, I'm everywhere you want to be. I've stalled the runways of Paris and redefined fine as a voluptuous full figure woman. I'm a fashion statement. Here's my book and my look. 25 years ago, my dude was all picks and froze and Afro puffs, but today you might see me straightened, braided, ball weaved, wig twisted, dyed, or locked in a dreadful head full, all woolly woven around my strong brown shoulders. Just so there's no mistaking my, my identity, I am free black and 25, independent of mind and centered in the spirit. I know who I am. I'm only telling you because I think you should know who you're dealing with. But mine is an open book, a public diary. I didn't write it to read to you. I love you. Say, brother, look here. You've even got your own page to tell me what's in your heart. I tell you what's in mine. Over the last 25 years, I've soared and stumbled, but always forward. I'm only 25, but I've been around. I've been there. 
For you, my sister, and for you, my brother, all along, you know me, I'm Essence. When you have those kinds of role models and you have people with whom you live every day who know the pain and the struggle that others have gone through and they either protect you from having to go through it or they help you learn skills to deal with it, there's no way that you can't achieve the excellence that you, for which you strived all of your life. And that is indeed the blessings that I have had all of my life. I have been in situations, uh, I, was in, <laughs> I was president of a community college in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, my friends still tease me about being at a place called Lynchburg uh, with visions of black people hanging from trees everywhere, I'm sure. And at the time, Jerry Falwell Sr. was president of the college, very conservative community. Uh, but I had the, some of the most positive experiences ever in that town because we were the only public institution of higher education there and everybody had gone there. And, you know, I, I have never been one to feel like I have to overdress because I'm the president. Uh, you know, I wear a, a college sweatshirt and jeans just like everybody else because I need people to understand I have a life just like they do. And I would go places and they'd say, oh, you go to CVC? CVC? I say every day, you know, uh, but it would make them feel better, you know, perhaps about being there. But we had a situation once where the Black Student Union was having its first meeting of the year. They put up posters around the school and somebody wrote on there, watermelon fried chicken and red soda will be served. I went ballistic. I went back to my office and I, I composed an email to send out and I had to rewrite that sucker three or four times before it would, it, the fire was, you know, palatable for the rest of the institution. And I had the faculty read it to every class that they had. And I told them, you know, this is an institution of higher education where whether you agree with everybody's opinions or not, everybody's got a right to express them. Uh, you know, and this is not the way that we're going to deal with uh, diversity at our institution. And if I find out who did it, you're going to have serious uh, uh, you know, trouble with me. Um, the next day I'm walking around campus and I have these two black women who are sitting in the front row of class asleep. And I'm sitting here going, I just put my job on the line for you and you're going to sit there asleep. And I heard Araneta and Flavia and some of the other folks on this call saying, you better, you better screen a uh, school them sisters. So I knocked on the door and excused myself to uh, the, the professor. And I said, what, what's this? And then he said, I have no clue. So I went and I shook him. I said, we don't sleep in class. You're here to learn, not to sleep. You sleep when you're at home, on the bus, in the car, in the parking lot, but you don't sleep in class. Word got out before the class was over that the president was coming reading students. You have to help people understand their own behavior. You have to help them understand the perception that other people have of you. Uh, when Sharon was at San Antonio College with me, I had a student who came to take a test and she had those wonderful pink rollers in her hair. Uh, and again, I took my life into my hands and I, I pulled her aside. I said, you know, it's unfortunate that when one black person is achieving something, he or she is the only one that gets credited with it. But if one of us screws up, we all get painted with that same brush. Those are the kinds of lessons that um, that my mentors shared with me as I was growing up and things that I have tried to share with my son and with others that I have mentored. I have to tell you, Reggie is uh, he's a mess, but he asked me if I would write a book with all the lessons that I had tried to teach him because he doesn't feel parents today teach their children the things that they need to be successful. Uh, you know, from appearance to attitude to having self-confidence when you walk in a room, you know, uh, those are the kinds of things that I was taught and the, and the kinds of things that Taylor, I, I try to exhibit and hope I don't embarrass you as president of the commission when I go out to do that. But people have perceptions of you and you have to help them either get rid of the bad perceptions they have or the erroneous perceptions they have uh, and learn, you know, that I'm not everybody else. I don't dress like everybody else. I don't talk like everybody else. I, you know, whatever stereotype you have may not fly with me. And you need to understand that you're dealing with me. You're not dealing with every African-American or every woman in the universe and uh, with whom you'll run in to. So um, I, 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 I let you all know that support is what it takes for success uh, anywhere along the line. Uh, I'm from a generation where everybody in the neighborhood raised me. Everybody around raised me. If I went to somebody else's house, I lived by their rules, whether I liked them or not. 
Um, I, I raised my child the same way. Some of his friends wouldn't come over because they knew they had to put up with Dr. Whelan and, and her rules. And I, that's the way it worked for me. I think I turned out okay. Uh, and I perpetuate that. And if I ever get around to writing a book, I'm going to say that in the book as well. I think it's very important. The, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement that has come along now brings back some very painful memories from the 60s. And we were hopeful in the 60s that we, had, we would never have a generation of children who would have to do that again, that we would not have to march for things for which we felt we were owed or that we had earned the right to have. Uh, and so it, it has been interesting to watch. Living here in the Atlanta area, it has been more interesting for me than in San Antonio because we had whites of goodwill in the 60s in San Antonio because we were only 6% of the population. So most of the folks who were marching, you know, didn't look like us. I didn't expect that in Atlanta because of such a large African-American population, but they got more white folks with Black Lives Matter signs in their yard than Black folks got Black Lives Matter signs in their yard. And, and so there is, in spite of uh, you know, the, the fight that's going on in Congress right now because of one elected officials here and the celebration of two that we elected back in January. I mean, it's just crazy right now. And I, I would love to think that if some of those old values that were taught to me were taught again to, to people today, we wouldn't have those kinds of, of challenges. We've always had uh, people who would run amok every now and then, but it just seems to have seeped into our institutions like never before. Taylor, I don't, uh, I don't envy you with having to deal with free speech issues uh, at the university because it's, it's almost like we've forgotten how to disagree. You know, if you don't believe what I believe, then you're wrong and, and you need to be put out. Uh, I, I never, that was never on my agenda. I, we loved to debate. I mean, the debate team was where you wanted to be when you grew up. It didn't mean that you couldn't go out and, you know, ha have a meal together afterwards. It just meant that you had a difference of opinion. And I don't know where we went wrong. Um, but it's, it, it, it warms my heart to see that there is a generation who's still willing to stand up for the things uh, in which they believe as my generation stood up for things in which they believe. I hope that um, each of you still understands that it is your responsibility to make a difference in the lives you touch, whether they're your children by choice or birth or uh, happenstance that, uh, and whether they're your friends, uh, you know, you owe it to them to help them understand the struggle is not over. The poem that was read at the beginning is absolutely wonderful, but I hate to think that in 2021, we're still fighting the battles that we did in 1961. Um, it is a reality. I'm trying to do my part. I know those of you who helped uh, shape me and hopefully those I helped to shape uh, are, are finding that those lessons are still very valuable uh, and that nobody should be able to tell us who we are or what we're doing or what we can do or can't do other than ourselves and that we have to pursue excellence in order for us to come to continue to move forward. I, I teasingly tell my white friends, you know, y'all stopped having babies and black folks and brown folks still having babies. And so you're going to have to start recruiting people to your institutions that you didn't bother to think about before, because that's all you're going to have. Uh, our whole nation's global positioning is going to depend upon everybody being educated and everybody having a credential of some sort so they can be productive in this world. Uh, and we're going to have to get past the color of their skin or the gender uh, to which they identify and realize that it is the minds that they carry with them and the attitudes that they have that will make them come forward. I will be glad to answer any questions. I know that Deja has got a few of them there. Hello. Hi, Deja. Sorry, I was writing notes and stuff, so I didn't want to show my concentration face. Um, so yeah, I do have a few questions for you. Um, the first one is, I'm just looking down at my notes. Um, with the change of our society, how, uh, like how um, do you feel the role of young women leaders is impacted? Is what? Impacted. Impacted. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's better than it was when when I was coming along back in the dark ages because our college classrooms are 60% female nowadays, 
uh, you know, when I was in school, I was lucky to see, you know, five other women in any of the classes that I took. Uh, and when I got to college, I had all male professors where I was coming out of a high school where I had all nuns. Uh, you know, so it was it was very, very interesting. But I think there um, there is a, uh, a there are many more mo role models out there today. I was 30 years old before I ever met a, do a female black female with a doctorate. Uh, I, your generation doesn't have to deal with that. You know, uh, you have female presidents, vice presidents, deans, you know, directors who are there uh, into whose office you can go and say, you know, help me here. This is not necessarily an academic issue, but it's one that's impacting my career. I didn't have that. Being the only black in my, in my senior class in high school, they didn't even counsel me to go to college. You know, they just figured, well, she's a little colored girl. She ain't going nowhere. I ain't going to worry about her. You know, and now there are only two of us out of my graduating class that went to college, and I was one of them. So I think that the support that I had, uh, while it was more condensed, you can find it anywhere. And so I think that's a major difference. You've got the vice president of the United States as a female, for heaven's sakes. Uh, you know, you've got role models that are at the top of the echelon. Uh, and so there, there's really no excuse. You just, uh, but it helps if those people are closer to you. Uh, you know, you can, you can aspire from afar, but if you don't have those people right there in front of you, it makes all the difference in the world because you, you feel like you're dreaming otherwise where people around you help you know that it's possible. Wow. Yeah. I agree with that, actually. Wow, 30 before you ever, like, had a doctor, like, you met a female doctor. That's it's crazy to think of. I've met some in, like, elementary school. I understand, but it was my generation that had to open those doors for you to be able to have that. And it was because of the generation behind me that pushed me to be able to, uh, you know, to be able to do it. So every generation has a responsibility to keep that going. Yes, ma'am. I agree. Um, if you had to determine which roadblock you had to maneuver in your professional life that influenced your path towards being an African-American woman leader, what would that roadblock be? You know, I, <laughs> I have been blessed enough to have interviewed for every job for which I've applied uh, and, and been offered all but one of them. And so I can't honestly tell you I've had roadblocks other than when I first started and the woman at St. Phillips told me she didn't need another black woman teaching for her. Uh, I really have not had any roadblocks. I have made sure that I prepared myself before I moved forward. I had either the uh, academic credentials or the experience to be able to move forward. Uh, that way I knew they couldn't close any doors in my face because there were federal laws that said they couldn't. <laughs> So, wow. Yeah. Um, you are considered one of the top 100 women leaders in our society. <laughs> Who on <laughs> whose list? <laughs> well, you're considered. I'm just, I'm, I'm a messenger. <laughs> yeah, the 99, I want to meet them. <laughs> so, well, speaking of those 99, what attributes do you think uh, you and those 99 women have in common? I don't know them, obviously, but uh, I, I think that probably a, a very strong sense of self, you know, and that feeling that I can do this, this strong self-concept. Uh, they've got to have a support system, whether it's one made up of all women or all men or a combination of both, uh, you know, but somebody who believes in them uh, and who's willing to give them an opportunity. There are so many people, men and women, who could do wonderful jobs, but nobody ever sees them. The other thing is, I think that they're assertive enough that they let people know what their goals are. You know, nobody's a mind reader. And so we don't know that you want to be, you know, the next dean of the department or, or, you know, director of the department or college president or whatever. You have to tell people what your goals are. Every time I, I had a, an administrative job, because I had got my doctorate in community college leadership and they had convinced me I could be a president one day, uh, I would tell my supervisors, I want to be a president. And so I need you to help me have some experiences that I wouldn't ordinarily get just by being a director of developmental ed or, you know, a, a dean of student services. You know, I, I need to be able to go to the legislature with you. I need to sit in on the budget meetings because you, you, you have to have those experiences to move forward. But nobody's going to just look at you and say, 
you look like a potential president. Eh, I look like a whole bunch of things. I don't think that's one of them. Uh, and so I think that, you know, having that uh, self-concept to go out there and say, this is what I want and I'd like for you to help me do it is also something that they have. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I'd have to meet them to know what they were thinking. <laughs> I, I think, I think those are pretty I think those are pretty important to have as a as a woman and especially like to be one of the top 100 like you I think those are all <laughs> really good attributes to have. <laughs> yeah, it, it's been interesting to me though to meet so many women who don't have that confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, I have I've been able to ask questions ever since I was a little girl, you know, going up and I've had women say you can do that bell go try that. You know, those of the the, uh, the Flavias and Ant uh, Arenettas on there who know me, uh, they know me by Bell Louise cuz Louise is my maiden, my middle name and I was always Bell Louise growing up and so Bell Louise you can do that Bell Louise why don't you try to do this Bell Louise why don't you do this and so I okay you know, and I get out there and try it. I didn't fear much of anything other than my mother. Uh, and there's so many women who don't have that sense of self-concept. And I don't know how to help them develop it. That's what, that was one of my uh, biggest frustrations, you know, in being a, a faculty member. I could not get some of them to feel comfortable even asking questions, you know, and I could look at their faces going, she don't know what I'm talking about. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. Why don't you say so? You know, and I don't want to embarrass anybody by calling on them, but I still want them to be involved and, you know, know what's going on. So I I, I still struggle with how to, to get that intrinsic, uh, you know, self-concept out of some folks. Well, whenever you figure out how... <laughs> Let me know too. Just do it. <laughs> Nike Nike says just do it. You know, <laughs> the worst that can happen is you'll make a mistake. Oh well, you try again. Yeah. Okay. You know? Okay. Or you'll know that that's something at which you can't be successful. So you go find something else. Okay. You might be onto something with that one. Okay. <laughs> um, behind every successful man is a strong woman. So it's often said. What do you feel is behind every successful woman? Another another successful woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's sometimes a, a successful man. <laughs> you know, I think I think women have grown up playing together nicely. I mean, that's just something that we did. Little boys grow up competing against each other, you know, on athletic teams and stuff. But women have always been taught to, to play well together. And I think as we move forward in life, we call upon our sister friends to say, OK, I'm, I'm trying this. I need you to, you know, have my back. Let's move forward. And that is minor on one level, but it makes a big difference, I think, as we're going forward. Uh, you know, when I have found over the years that, uh, and Taylor, you can correct me, when men get together, together because they're down and out they sit and talk about football or basketball or something else they never talk about the problem <laughs> women on the other hand boy they're gonna rehash every part of that problem until we have just known all every molecule and we come up with a solution and then we're, we're going for it that makes a big difference because that's what that's the way we define support and that helps us to understand what we're thinking, to get the thoughts out of our head for somebody else to, to uh, you know, provide that affirmation for us. And then we can go forward. I don't know how men interpret that when they don't ever talk about it. Uh, maybe, Taylor, you can shed some light on that one. <laughs> yeah. It needs to be unmuted. Yeah. There you go. I don't know, Bill, if I have any wisdom other than I, I'm I'm I think women should just run the world and everything is going to be in a much better place. We're getting there. Yes. <laughs> Maybe one day in my lifetime I'll see a, a female president, not a vice president. Could be you. Mm. Could be you. Sure it could. Why not? It technically could be me. I just have no desire. Okay, well that's different. Yeah, that's different. That's different. That's different, but it could be. I never thought I'd be secretary of education either, but Mark Warner, when he was elected governor, called me and said he had been watching me since I was president at Lynchburg and appreciated the way I worked for, you know, with the business community and senior institutions and asked me to come be his secretary of education. I didn't see myself doing that either, but I did. So don't write it off. Well, if I ever become president, I will mention you in my inauguration speech. Oh, you're too kind. <laughs> 
there any other questions for anyone else? Let me open it up. If someone would like to uh, ask Dr. Whelan a question, uh, please do so in the chat. I have to uh, tell you all that Deja is Gomez is one of our African American Studies minors and a senior here at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And I had to really talk her into participating and I, I'm really glad she's doing a good job. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. Dr. Whelan, let me ask you a question. Okay. What steps would you suggest to the two young mothers in preparing their young daughters to, to succeed in life? Um, try not to force them into stereotypical roles, number one. You know, if uh, I, I think it's one of the challenges for both men and women, we, we see little boys and force them to play sports and force them into, you know, liking cars and things when they'd really rather be a, you know, a lecturer or a physicist or something. Uh, encourage that creativity when they're young. Uh, there's no reason to decide what you want to be when you grow up when you're three years old. You got plenty of time ahead of you, even Deja, if you're 21 years old, it's, it's a little more rush for you than a three-year-old, but, uh, you know, take some time and, and find out what you like. That's what college was all about, for you to experiment a little bit and find, you know, take a little of this and a little of that and a lot of the other, and so that you could kind of figure out what career you wanted to choose. Uh, be supportive of uh, of our children, you know, and the things, and and don't be afraid to tell them no. I see so many parents, you know, I, well, they may get mad, okay, <laughs> you know, I, all right. I was mad with my mom a bunch of times. I have learned to tell Reggie, I love you, but I don't like you very much today. <laughs> you know, uh, because there is a difference in liking, you know, the behavior that your child is experiencing or expressing and loving them for who they are. And I think too often parents, you know, feel like it's a popularity contest. Hey, but it's not a popularity contest. You know, I'm still the mother you, and you don't have to like me, but you have to do what I say or there's the door. Go for it. I did pack Reggie's clothes up once and put him out when he did something I didn't like. He, he was petrified. I said, you know, I told you ahead of time. It's my house, my rules. <laughs> so now I can't get him to leave, you know. Hey, well, I tell that Dr. Amy has a question. Dr. Amy? Hey, hey Bill, I, um, uh, you know, higher ed has, has done a pretty good job of providing a mentoring environment. Uh, many of our, our higher ed associations uh, sponsor uh, our young academics and women and, and, and folks of color to, 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 to go off and get mentored. Is there any chance that if Deja wanted to be mentored that, that, that SAC COC does mentoring? Uh, do you have that opportunity? I know you're so busy with 31,000 institutions. <laughs> I actually only have 781 member institutions, Taylor. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would be honored. Uh, I have more mentees than Carter has liver pills, for those of you old enough to remember Carter's liver pills. Uh, and, you know, and I feel like that's my job. And I always have, you know, the women who were successful before me reach back and pull me forward. And I feel like it's my job to reach back and pull others. So you've got my email address. That's the easiest way to catch up with me, by all means, um, you know, send me, uh, oh, Flavia. Thank you, Flavia. <laughs> little bell louise i'm gonna get you for that one uh, there's a question here in this box that asks about uh possible leadership opportunities that this generation might take that would add value to the next any opportunity that you have to to step out and show your skills is a good one whether it's in the sorority to volunteer to be a committee chair or just an active member on a committee whether it's in church you know to be part of the usher board or the choir or whatever it is, the girls, whatever it is that you have, your neighborhood association, everybody's got a homeowners association now or uh, something in the apartment, you know, join that and, and learn some leadership skills. When I was in Lynchburg, there were two African-American females who were in top leadership positions and every organization called upon us to be on their board. Oh my God, I was on the chamber board, the United Way board, the hospital board. It's like 
time out. Y'all going to kill me. Uh, well, but they didn't know anybody else because we were the two most visible. So I said, let me help you. So I went to United Way and we put a leadership program together for specifically to teach minorities how to serve on boards. You know, what is, how do you carry a motion? Uh, you know, how do you read a, a spreadsheet or a, a budget report? Uh, those are not skills that we're born with. You know, those are things that we learn as we get involved in different um, activities. And so I encourage each of you, that the first place you can start is any United Way supported agency. I got started with the uh, Mental Health Association. I taught psychology. And so I went to the Mental Health Association and got involved with them as a volunteer and then ended up on their board. Uh, you know, I was uh, in Lynchburg. I was, uh, my child went to the uh, before and after school of the YMCA, YWCA. And so I was involved with that and ended up president of the YWCA board. So, I mean, those are the kinds of things that, you know, it doesn't take rocket science. You don't have to be, you know, in a Fortune 500 company board, but you have to learn those skills somewhere along the way. So just step up and get involved. Um, I imagine those of you who are students could go to your uh, student activities director and say, hey, I got five hours a week that I want to give. Help me. You know, and they will find some place for you, I am sure. Um, you know, they're and they're reading at elementary schools, uh, teaching math to, to students who can't stand math or can't grasp math. I mean, those are the kinds of skill sets that you have that will just take some of your time. And I learned a long time ago that your time is actually much more valuable than your money, uh, you know, because it's it's harder to come by sometimes. And so just because you're not making a lot of money does not mean that you can't give back. And in giving back, you learn some skills that perhaps you didn't have either. Bill, we have time for one more question. I see that uh, we have both Dr. Myron Anderson and our Sarah moved up about I am one of the educators. This is from uh, Dr. Aricella Johnson Fannin, who also would wake them up. We don't see that, that now. How do we get all our educators to take the opportunity today? The responsibility I think some, today. Sure. I think sometimes just bringing it to their attention, you know, and helping them remember that that is part of their responsibility. When you have faculty members who are trying to reach uh, minority students and they themselves are not minority. There's an awkwardness there and there's a fear that they'll be misinterpreted. When I was at San Antonio College, I had a colleague in the reading department uh, who had this young black woman she was trying to reach and she just, so she came to me. I was, I think I was one of five Tracy would have to help me, five black faculty out of 200 faculty or some such ridiculously small number. So she came to me and she, she told me her problem. And I said, you're probably the first white person that's ever showed her any interest and she doesn't believe you for real. So if I were you, I'd go back and say, you know, you probably think that I'm the, you know, don't, I'm not for real because I'm the first white person that's ever showed an interest in you, but, but I am. And when you decide to accept that, let me know. And then we'll get about the business of teaching you. And two weeks later, I come to the office. I have three yellow roses and a vase waiting for me from the faculty member, because that's exactly what she did. And the woman, you know, uh, woke up and said, oh, okay. I mean, just sometimes it's just raising the awareness of folks that, you know, this is your job. And, and and if the person likes it or not, they can either drop the class or they can get on board and realize that you are for real. But you have to be for real. You can't have step through that one. If you if you make that uh, overture, then you've got to be willing to carry it through. But sometimes it's as simple as just pulling a coattail to it. Well, unfortunately, we probably need to stop the questions. I have to tell you all. Uh, Dr. Bell Whelan gave me a baby shower 36 <laughs> years ago for my youngest child. 37. It's getting ready to be 37, Bell. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> With great pleasure, I am going to uh, request that we change the program just slightly. And now that Dr. Alejandra Elenas has joined us, that she please close out our program. As I told you, Dr. Elenas is our department chair for race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality studies. Dr. Elenas. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Ms. Rodas, and um, I, my sincere apologies that uh, what a day for Zoom not to work for me. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, so thank, so I apologize for not being here to do the introductions that I was gonna, uh, that I was planning to do. And I thank Carla for stepping in and everybody for the flexibility within the program. So, and especially I wanna uh, extend my thanks to Dr. Whelan because uh, your words have been so inspirational. I, uh, as I, I was just thinking right now, as you're answering the questions, uh, your warmth and your welcoming and your generosity comes very clear. Uh, you're also showing us um, the importance of leadership in the and within the the strength uh, of Black women, and you're speaking for the challenges of the time in ways that you're recognizing the power that we have to to create change, uh, but also and in doing that, uh, taking on the really difficult times that we're living at this moment in terms of systematic racism, uh, COVID inequalities that have existed before COVID, but they're becoming quite apparent. But at the same time, all that with a sense of humor that gives us so much power. So I am just, I'm, I'm very, very inspired by your words and um, learning a lot about how we can maintain the work that has been done. Uh, one of the things that I, I was thinking as you, you were talking about we, uh, how we expect, we hope that the next generation doesn't have to do the work that that has been done. And I'm always reminded when I hear about Martin Luther King's words about uh, children, and I was one of the children that he was referring to. And uh, so now uh, I'm hoping that my children, and if I ever get have grandchildren, <laughs> that they yeah, that they won't have to do the this work, right? But we know that the struggle continues, and it's not going to stop unless we continue working towards uh, a better society. And that's what we do as as educators. So um, I appreciate so much uh, your that your talk today. Um, Dr. Amy, thank you so much for all the support. Uh, and again, I apologize that I wasn't able to introduce you as we had planned, but I thank you so much for being here. And to everybody in attendance, I think this was a man, uh, an amazing event and I'm really very, very, uh, very proud of all the work that was done today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Elanis. Bill, thank you for coming and being with us. I really appreciate my just asking you and you just, yes, Carla. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know who to tell yes and who to tell no, Carla. So. <laughs> so thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Best thank of luck you. to you all. <laughs>